So what is NAD plus and how is it used in the body? Yeah, so um, NAD plus would be what I think of as a hub molecule in cells and mitochondria, meaning it, it's, um, if you were to think of our airline system, it would be like a big airport like a Chicago or Dallas that a lot of other molecules depend on to get where they're going inside cells. And um, when I would have taken biochemistry, 93, I think, was uh, my first year of naturopathic school, I would have learned that NAD had a couple of really important jobs. One, it's absolutely essential to make ATP, the energy our mitochondria pump out so that cells can do work. Um, NAD kind of, for listeners, think of it as something that carries the electrons or stored energy in food and allows them to be made into energy in mitochondria. So that, that's one job. Um, NAD can also accept a phosphate molecule and become something called NADP or NAD, uh, it's actually NADP plus or NADPH. Um, that role that I learned way back when was about building molecules, but especially molecules like glutathione that are used for cellular defense purposes and detoxification. So that, think of that as another category of jobs that that NAD uh, molecule does. It's in a big player in keeping our cells able to deal with stress and to help us as people detoxify things and um, you know have good antioxidants defense systems. And then what happened late 90s, early 2000s with work, um, I think it was out of an MIT lab, but it was the, the names are people like David Sinclair, who I'm sure some listeners will have heard of, um, Leo Guarenti, who ran the lab at the time. Um, I think Charles Brenner was another one touched in with that. But what they eventually found was that the NAD molecule had a completely different role than I learned about and than those two. And they're sometimes described as consumption roles. But the way to think of it is that NAD molecule is used to activate certain enzyme systems in the body. And part of that process is the molecule gets broken apart. It, so it gets consumed. And um, sirtuins would be the enzyme system. David Sinclair you know, still um, talks a lot about that. And think of it in that context, the NAD molecule is fuel to drive those sirtuin systems. And uh, for okay. listeners, yep. sirtuins on a cellular level, are really involved with allowing cells to respond resiliently to all kinds of stress. So, so think of that as a, a, a important job. And one, clearly that's super important as we get older, but as our cells get older. And then um, once they had found that, they found that other roles that will also fit in that NAD being used as fuel, like being devoured to fuel an enzyme. Another one of those are called PARPs, but PARPs are enzymes that repair DNA. So obviously, again, super important for healthy aging. So th that new discovery of these consumption purposes is, I think, lit the imagination of the researchers thinking, okay, maybe NAD is way more important for longevity than the biochemistry books would have taught me way back. And around 2013, and this was David Sinclair's lab, um, used NMN at the time. Their NMN would be a precursor, something that our cells can use to make the NAD molecule. And when he gave that to older, I believe it was mice, but rodents of some kind, they just aged healthier. Their, their hair was more glossy, they stayed leaner, they were more active. And that study was the tipping point for then really, I think, lighting the fuse, so to speak, under the NAD bonfire and getting research and researchers to start to do a lot of work on that molecule. Okay, so I have some questions on this. Yeah. Um, sirtuins, they're NAD dependent, right? Like those Correct. can't go without the NAD being there. I know, I remember that. And then, you know, it's like going back to 1993, I do remember, I just re originally remember learning it for the Krebs cycle, right? It was a... Yeah. It was a, yeah. the hydrogen came off, the hydrogen went on as it went around the Krebs cycle. Correct. Yeah, that would be that um, first, that ATP role as the, the carrier of electrons. And that shifting between the NAD plus and NADH. In biochemistry, that's called a redox reaction. But mm -hmm. in that reaction, the molecule, the NAD core is unchanged. It's just 
gaining and losing electrons, kind of toggling right. back and forth. But that NAD dependent sirtuins that you mentioned, that's what I mean by consumption. And Got in it. that role, the NAD molecule is broken into pieces. And that's one of the reasons we need more of that than say like the vitamin B2 molecule that's involved in, in the Krebs cycle. Um, which is why if you look on the, like a, your supplement facts in a multivitamin, 100% of the DV on vitamin B3 is a lot more than it would be for vitamin B2. Okay. Because while they both are involved in that Krebs cycle piece, NAD in those dependent things is consumed. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. What is the difference between NAD plus and NMR? Uh, you is mean NMR NMN? Just a, or NMN, I'm sorry. NMN is just a precursor? Yeah, so okay. um, there's different ways to make the NAD molecule. Um, there's two main pathways to make it. One is called the Price-Handler pathway. And listeners probably know that many things in medicine and biology are named after whoever discovered them. So no surprise, Price and Handler were the two scientists that uh, I think it was the late 30s discovered how the flushing niacin, nicotinic acid, could be made into NAD. And the reason that a lot of research emphasis went into it at then was because of um, the vitamin B3 deficiency disease that was really very prevalent in the early 1900s. So they were trying to figure out both how to cure that deficiency disease and then how vitamin B3 was metabolized. But um, so think of the fleshing niacin, um, sometimes called nicotinic acid, kind of comes in through its own doorway and eventually makes any. Um, the other classic vitamin B3 is called niacinamide. Niacinamide is then made into NMN, and then NMN is made into NAD in, okay. in its own pathway. That's called the salvage pathway. And then NR was much more newly figured out. NR can either be made into niacinamide and then to NMN or go directly to NMN. <laughs> so so it, it kind of is its own new doorway to make NMN and then ultimately NAD. Okay. And so one of the things I know that I believe when cells have multiple ways of doing something, then I, as a, you know, like a, more of a holistic thinker, want to support all three. So right. rather than just give, oh, well, let's just give NR, nicotinamide riboside, I would want to give, let's give a little bit of the fleshing niacin and let's give some of the niacinamide and let's give some of the nicotinamide riboside because they all kind of come in in their own unique ways to support cells in making it. And it seems like some cells have a preference for one form over others. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, just sort of like give them the orchestra to do the thing. Yeah, and they'll figure it out, right? If I, My um, bias has always been a big part of health isn't necessarily trying to control what cells or tissues do, but give them the resources they need and remove the obstacles for them using them. And then usually they'll figure it out, right? They evolve to be way smarter um, in terms of, getting their needs met than we'll probably ever know as scientists. That's very naturopathic of you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Re remove the obstacles to cure, right? That, that, that Absolutely. Makes, yep. yep. And give the body what it needs and let it do it. Let it do its thing. Um, okay. So the, for the listeners, B3 is niacin, just so the listeners know and when, when we're, when he's talking about B vitamins and then niacin, that's, that's B3. And then, yeah, the deficiency that was pellagra. I remember, right? Isn't that pellagra? Yeah, and we would have learned about it as the 3Ds, sometimes 4Ds, but it stood for the, the classic symptoms. So the, the 3 deficiency, Plagra, um, 1D was for dementia, but not in the Alzheimer's type of sense, but more in the sense like brain fog, issues with mood, that like lack of mental clarity, like really poor um, cognitive function in many different ways. Um, one was dermatitis, so B3 deficiency, has a really classic red scaly rash. I mean, it can also be on the tongue. And then the third D was diarrhea. Um, and actually, it doesn't have to be deficiency, but even inadequate amounts of the molecules that make NAD tend to cause either leaning towards constipation or diarrhea. But like some kind of GI thing very commonly would show up. This sounds a lot like a lot of elderly folks, though. For sure. Yep. And one of the, um, this was a recent study, Nestle's, the, um, the, the food company just sponsored a study. And what they found in animals is that niacinamide, which is another form of B3, 
was lower in older animals than it was in younger animals, even if the diet was kept the same. So somehow it just wasn't making its way into circulation from the diet. Um, and human studies seem to correspond to that so far. So we, we need more of these things to make NAD as we get older, for sure. Yeah, for um, sure. And then the fourth D that I alluded to was death. So. Oh, I, you're bringing it all back. I'm remembering all of that. It's all coming. And then corn, right? If you eat too much corn, you can get pellagra. Yeah. So what would happen in animal foods, just like in our cells, the, the way to think about NAD, and usually in science, the term would be called a metabolome. And when you see that ohm on the end of thing, think like gut microbiome. It, it means a collection, right? Like a, a grouping. And so NAD metabolome is often how it's described. And what that means is that there's the NAD, there's the NADH, there's the NADP that I mentioned. There's then the things like flushing niacin and NMN and NR that we've talked, all of those other molecules, right? So there's all the, there's a collection of NAD related molecules. The reason that's relevant in our cells, we have all that whole collection. And it, when we consume animal foods, they would have the whole collection. But in plants, what they usually have is something that's more like the flushing niacin form, but bound up with fibers. And so it's not really very bioavailable. Um, so like in a general sense, we eat animal foods, we get the whole collection of all the different molecules. But in corn, you'd only be getting that bound up form of vitamin B3. And when corn in the Native American traditions that were very corn dependent, was used as a staple food. They always processed it with limestone, alkali lime. And that, that both changes the calcium amount in say tortillas or corn, but it, it liberates that bound niacin so that it's available to use. And so what happened in the early 1900s is parts of the South where corn was a staple food, but didn't process it in that old way, where functionally became B3 deficient because they couldn't get what was in the food and they weren't eating enough animal products to make up the difference. 